Good morning, Ashley. Sir, there you are. All right. Welcome, uh, sir. So we've got approximately 44 participants. And the um, floor is yours, sir. Good. Well, thank you uh, very much, Ashley, and uh, for the opportunity. And uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, glad to see that uh, there is a huge uh, attendance uh, to this online course. What Ashley is doing is, is extremely important. And, and uh, you know, keeping up with our clinical skills is always a priority, but uh, even more uh, in these days uh, for, for two main reasons. Uh, the first one is the demand we will have in the next few days. Uh, as you're aware, uh, we have um, probably up to 2,000 reservists that will join us uh, for Uplaser and Uplantis. And these reservists have uh, a reserve class C contracts, so that means that uh, we'll have to provide them with emergency dental treatment and and maybe more, we'll see. Uh, so my expectation is that we will have more and more patients uh, that will require endodontic therapy and even within our rec force members since we're not treating them as we treat them normally. Uh, I expect the number uh, of endos that will rise. So keeping our uh, skills updated in endo will be critical. The second aspect is is the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, as you know, uh, creating aerosol is is uh, is quite critical, and uh, be able to provide a quick and very effective treatment will be again critical. Um, as you can imagine, if you have the proper PPE and uh, will have also the proper health air uh, filtration system installed in your clinics very soon, uh, we will be treating patients that will be COVID positive or that are symptomatic uh, if, uh, if there's a need. Um, so that means that you need to know what you're doing, meaning that uh, before you start your treatment, you should have a clear mental image of uh, the root canal anatomy. Uh, you should be able to have a movie in your head and be able to go sequence um, at step by step about everything you'll be doing during that appointment and make sure that all your equipment and all the supply you will use during the treatment will be ready. Uh, now on, you know, treating these patients, uh, it will not be the time for you or your dentist to walk around the clinic, uh, check in three different bays to find out where the EDTA bottle is located. Uh, you need to make sure you're, you know, you know exactly what you'll be doing. Your all your equipment is set up, and you go in and you go out very quickly. You do high quality treatment, but you want to be as effective as you can be. So please enjoy the, the online course. Uh, I know uh, that Ashley has a great product to offer to you, and uh, your, your feedback will be very welcome to Ashley and through your chain of command. And uh, hopefully uh, that will be a, a positive um, you know, experience for you. Uh, hopefully the technology will work well, and, and I hope that will also give the idea to other specialists working in our clinics to do the same in, in other uh, uh, discipline of dentistry. So on that note, I uh, wish you a great, a great course and a great day, everybody. So take right, care. Thank you so much, sir. I appreciate that. And also, uh, Major Meadows is uh, we're both doing this. We're tag teaming, so just like the end of course. Oh. Hi, Regan. She might be on mute. Hello, sir. Okay. How are you? Very good. So thanks thanks to you too, uh, Regan. I'm just uh, helping out. Ashley's driving the bus. <laughs> and we both know it. We all the three of us know it. Perfect. All right, sir. Thank so you. Have a great time. course. Take care. Bye-bye.
Okay, so I really appreciate your time. This is the first uh, first of four sessions like we were talking about. We're slowly getting people in, and if you join, slowly join, uh, don't forget to keep on mute. There is an opportunity at the end to do a discussion. We're hoping to keep this for an hour, but there's, um, we'll just see how it rolls. So I'm going to, hopefully you can, Reagan, you can see my screen. Yes, I can. So I'm just gonna keep it like this. Let's go ahead and hit play. Let me get rid of this. All right. So the real intent is to kind of spread some information as a as a Canadian Armed Forces provider, whether you're military or civilian, it doesn't it doesn't matter. We're all in this together. So that's really the intent because there's a lot of CE, like I mentioned before, there's a lot of CE, it's inundated, but it's not really focused to treating our military population. And I believe we have there's a couple different things that we can work together as a group to kind of sort out. So we've talked to Colonel Brochu. Now the objectives of this is really, we're gonna do a case review uh, in your, you know, we're gonna review a case and see what you think. We're gonna work on some diagnosis. We're gonna talk about COVID-19. And then at the end, we'd be really interested in hearing your, your, your experiences as a provider right now. And if you are doing some triaging and doing some patient care to share that with the rest of us. So that's really kind of at the end of this, and I would ask for you to share uh, your comments and we'll sit, we, you know, we can set up a group, whatever, to continue to work together uh, and collaborate. And we're gonna talk about some treatment options at the initial stages after triage and you've done your teledentistry. So this is me, you can see me. There's our fantastic Major Meadows. She didn't send me a picture, so this is what we get. Thanks. You're welcome. So. I think one of the first points I wanted to talk about as a military member or civilian, you do have access to um, our the Canadian Armed Forces, what the messages are coming from the CDS. And I'm not sure a lot of, if this is repeat for some of you, I uh, just please play along. Some of you may not have seen this. These are some of the links that you'll be getting your, your enable access to. So you can go online and just see what the newest message is from the, the CDS. And right now, the CDS is talking about the most recent message that as of 3 April, really talked about the messages here. So while it's accessing your pay stub and there's more stuff regarding COVID-19. So if you if you kind of feel like you're in the dark and you don't have, you know, you haven't seen this, go ahead and take a look this at these. And one of the important points that he mentions is our current dispersed posture will continue until at least 30 of April unless tasked for operations. That means your place of duty remains at home, safe and ready for operations. So stay connected to your colleagues and chain of command for details about operational tasks. And that is one of the intents of what we're doing here is to maintain a community of providers together. So this is a shameless plug for the Endo course. This is uh, 2019 in October. So we've got uh, six students. We actually have an American student. There's major medals in the corner. Um, you can, so this is from last year. So part of, so in the continuing sessions in the next four sessions, we're going to talk about setting up your endo bay and some of our suggestions. We're really minimalist and it can help you get everything ready. So when you need to do your treatment, you're ready to rock because we all know what it's like to run around the clinic and look for stuff and it's painful and it drags the procedure on. In future, also, this is, uh, we're going to be talking about some intra So, where is the cancellous bone? It should flow. If it resists, stop and change your location. The moment of truth, a better word. Ready? So, that's a teaser video. This is your upcoming how to use intraosseous, how to do some more anesthesia techniques. Um, we also, during the endo course, so that will be part, so that this previous slide here will be part of the next couple series. This is another shameless hit for the uh, plug for the endo course. It's all microscope based, so you can see we're recording what you're doing so we can review it afterwards. This is the boss teaching a student what to do. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about IND. So we're gonna play this in Major Meadows. She doesn't know that yet, but she's never seen this. It's just basically to prevent healing of that incision so the pathway stays open. So we're gonna be talking more about these techniques of really simple things and also the armamentarium to get ready to get set up. So 
let's go ahead and let's just take a look at a case because this is relevant today. So you have this patient that presents or they call actually, they're gonna call on the phone and they say my upper left tooth has been, you know, it's hurting. And let's go ahead and take a look at what this, this was in the, the chart from a, a number of years ago. So you can read it here. And if you're, if, you're, if you're at work and you can read the chart, you know, these are some of the things you can do or look at the x-ray. But let's take a look and we're just gonna talk about diagnosis. So in October, this patient presents to the clinic with upper left pain to hot and cold. Now it's pressure sensitive. It doesn't wake me up at night and I chew on the other side. The history of pre pre presenting illness is the pain started three days ago. Bite test, so the lingual cusp was positive. There was no probing depths that were significant. So the treatment that was rendered was they removed the restoration, placed it upon a composite restoration. Okay, so in January, the patient presents again. Three months later, I have a swelling on the inside of my upper left cheek. History of present illness, the, starts, the swelling started after my filling about a month after. So the, the swelling started about a month after my filling, and it doesn't wake me up at night. And I'm not putting this to shame anyone, because I've done this myself before. I've been there. The intent of all this is to learn. So let's take a look here. So what was the diagnosis in October? So here you can see if you can anyone, and I'm not, you don't need to put your hand up. Let's just think about this. Are you able to make a diagnosis from the notes and the tests that were here? Now, the thing is, is that maybe the tests were done, but we don't know. And let's look in January again. Now I've highlighted the small periapical radiolucency. Can we make a diagnosis on this again with the information that's provided in the chart? So the problem is, is that uh, we don't know as providers if the actual examination was completed and that's okay. As long as it's referred to the right person, fine. But in this day, and, you know, in this time of COVID, I think we really need to, let's talk about the proper diagnostic tests. And it's like, we can talk about it till we're blue in the face, but let's actually watch somebody do it. So as I, Albert Einstein said, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. So let's walk through, this is where Major Meadows is gonna take over. She's gonna talk about how we're going to triage these patients on, on the phone, but then you see them and let's make sure we get everything covered because we don't want that patient to go away and come back because I've been there, patients come back after I've rendered treatment and I'm like, oh, what, what did I do wrong or what can I do better? So like I said, in this time, it's critical that we do the proper diagnosis. So we're gonna walk through our ended on diagnosis. So Major Meadows, I'm gonna let you go down this road now. Okay, so this is a really useful um, publication by the American Association of Endodontics. Uh, you can find it online if you just Google AAE endodontic diagnosis, and it'll walk you through the 2008 guidelines for um diagnosis i don't know ashley if you can bring that up i'm gonna bring it back up in one sec okay um so we all know what a normal pulp is um basically it's healthy um however maybe there is a slight chance that the uh, maybe the pulp has been stressed a bit but uh, when you're doing any of your thermal testing um you're not um, having any residual effects um, from your stimuli. Um, I guess I'm gonna go back um, a little bit and saying when you're coming up with an endodontic diagnosis, um, there's more than just to your, just your clinical testing, um, but right now I'm just gonna review your clinical testing in with regards to your pulp testing and your periapical test. So when you're giving a endodontic diagnosis, you have to make sure that you're looking at the pulpal diagnosis as well as the periapical diagnosis. There's many times when I'm looking in, when I've seen in charts or I'm discussing a case with someone that they're just giving me the pulpal diagnosis. And you can get a lot of information from the periapical diagnosis as well. So uh, make sure you're giving um, both uh, diagnosis. Um, 
right now you're going to have, um, if you look at a reversible pulpitis, most times you're not going to get a patient um, in an extreme amount of discomfort from this that lasts for a long period of time. Basically, when you stimulate the tooth, um, the, uh, the discomfort will disappear within a few seconds after you remove the stimuli. It's very important, though, if you have a patient that you've diagnosed with a reversible pulpitis, that you do follow up. Now, in our times, we can't really ideally bring the patient back in a two, in two weeks. Um, but uh, just for your future, um, just when you're seeing patients that potentially have a reversible pulpitis, um, say that there's been exposed dentin or there's caries or a deep restoration, maybe try to bring that patient back in about two weeks to a month's time to see how the patient's doing. One of the, the phone calls that the patients that are experiencing a symptomatic irreversible pulpitis or even a um, pulpal necrosis, though pulpal necrosis, you may not have pain unless you have uh, an abscess associated with it. But these are the phone calls that you guys are going to be getting um, at this point in time. Um, and so it's really important for us to be able to ensure that we're getting a, a good diagnosis of an irreversible pulpitis. Um, so usually when you're talking to the patient, they'll just describe a sharp pain. Um, it can be painful on a thermal stimuli, uh, lingering pain, um, and it can also be uh, unprovoked pain or even pain is referring. Um, Usually, in someone that has an irreversible pulpitis, uh, over the counter medication doesn't manage it, doesn't manage the pain well. Um, so, these are signs when you're asking patients questions, which we're going to review with you as well. These are some of the things that you're going to uh, take note of. Um, an asymptomatic irreversible pulpitis, I've always found this. Uh, diagnosis a bit confusing, but it's basically a case that has had no clinical symptoms, but may have had trauma or deep caries. And this was one that was added in in 2008 um, that I often find can sometimes confuse us. And then pulp uh, necrosis, um, ex you're basically you're not going to get any response to your hot and cold testing um, for the most part. Again, it, it can be tricky if the whole tooth hasn't completely necrosis and you have only partial necrosis, but usually for the most part, um, <clears throat> you will not have any responsive testing. Um, also, a necrosis itself does not necessarily cause, does not cause the apical periodontitis unless the canal is effect, infected. So you may not see any periapical changes um, until the infection is uh, extended down the pulp canal chamber or and into the canal system. Uh, we also have previously treated and previous, previously initiated therapy. Uh, one plug on previously initiated therapy. Whenever you are getting a root canal case that has been started by another provider, always make sure you start with a new radiograph because you never know um, what could potentially have been left behind by that previous um, provider. Okay, and um, I've had root canals where I've taken over and there's been a broken file in it or, and there hasn't been noted, because maybe the clinician didn't even know that they had broken off a file. So that's one of my um, guidelines is that if you're taking over a case, always start out with a new x-ray. Sometimes patients will be a little bit upset about multiple exposure for um, x-rays, but just explain to them why it's important. Um, now we'll go on to the, does it, we'll go on to the apical diagnosis. Um, so basically normal apical tissues. Um, so this, you're going to get your periapical diagnosis basically by um, doing any percussion or palpation testing. Um, basically for a normal apical tissue, uh, you're not going to have any sensitivity when you perform these tests on the patient. 
Um, a symptomatic apical um, periodontitis will um, represents inflammation um, in the apical periodontium. So you'll have uh, clinical symptoms that will produce um, involving painful response to biting, percussion, or palpation. Um, you may not see radiographic changes at this point in time because it may be so acute. Um, severe pain to percussion and palpation is usually indicate, indicative of a, a degenerating pulp, um, and the root canal treatment is will be required. Then an asymptomatic apical, peri, apical periodontitis. Um, what what you're going to see here is the patient isn't going to be having any symptoms, but you're going to see something um, radiographically at the apex. Um, chronic apical abscess or, um, or periodontitis. Um, basically, the pulp tissue has started, has necrosed and infection has spread, but it's been a very gradual onset. Um, but basically also you've had a sinus tract develop, and so you're getting your, your discharge through the sinus tract. So the patient may not even know it's there. Um, sometimes these are found basically on examination only, um, or if a patient just noticed they've got this little pimple in their gums, as many patients describe it as. Uh, very important when you're trying to determine the origin of this, you can take a radiograph with a piece of gutta percha. Um, at this point in time with COVID, we're trying to recommend taking using a panoramic radiograph, um, vice intraoral radiographs because intraoral radiographs produce more saliva. Um, but I, I believe that most of the panoramic radiographs um, have settings on them so that you can focus in to get a PA. I know the one in Halifax does, and I looked at it and it looks fairly decent. Um, so you should be able to get an X-ray. Um, using your pano machine. Um, an acute apical abscess, these are the ones uh, that there's inflammation reaction to pulpal infection and necrosis, and it's a rapid onset. So if there's spontaneous pain, the tooth is extremely tender to pressure, um, and you definitely can see swelling, maybe just intraorally, but it may have extended extraorally as well. And then condensing osteitis, you'll see a diffuse uh, radiopeg lesion. Um, at the end of the apex, just result that's showing that there's some bony changes going on due to the inflammation that's uh, present there. So let's go to the next slide there. Um, so that checklist that you see there, um, Major Mark has emailed that to you all. And this is something that I would recommend either you have a template in your CFHIS already. Um, but maybe it's something you could also print out at this time, especially because we're going to be triaging our patients over the phone a little bit more, um, by seeing them in person. So these are all, if, if you look at all the questions there, I think, uh, Major Mark has them broken down further on the next slide, but, um, if you can see question one is like, how long have you had the pain? Um, can you pinpoint the pain? Oftentimes, patients won't be able to um, tell you between uh, if it's a, sometimes they won't be able to tell you if it's a top tooth or a bottom tooth. They just say it's generalized or they can't tell the difference between two teeth that are side by side. Um, is there anything that makes the pain worse? Um, anything that makes it better? Is it spontaneous? And I often find that question, is it spontaneous? Um, is really key for us to determining whether or not it's an irreversible pulpitis because once you have spontaneous pain then that's usually a very good indication that non-surgical root canal therapy is required um do you have a bad taste in your mouth so then you're looking at to see if you can see anything like you're trying to see if the patients notice that if anything's draining um you're asking if there's a pimple in your gums does it wake you up at night? Because most of us can deal with pain during the day because we're busy, we're not concentrating on it. Uh, but as soon as you try to go to sleep or you're um, laying down, things start to throb or ache a little bit more. Um, and then, then you get into asking them, does it hurt to bite? Um, 
how would you describe the pain? So the patient's uh, view on their pain is very important as well. Um, and then you have to give them a scale. So if you see the mild or severe there on a scale of one to 10, and I often say um, 10 is the worst pain you've ever experienced. Five is where it starts to interrupt your day. So basically like you're working away and then you feel the pain and that, that I tell them that's about a five. Uh, you also wanna know whether or not the pain, if they can tell it's just coming from on tooth or if it's radiating everywhere. Um, does it hurt all the time, basically day or night? And then again, I already talked about relieve the pain. And then you also may, one question that you could have in there, are you taking any medication to help with that? Um, and then also, do you clench your teeth or grind your teeth? And those are questions that you're kind of looking like, okay, do we have a patient that has a parafunctional habit and are we looking at possibly a cracked tooth situation? So um, these are all questions that will help you start to formulate what is going on with your patient. Um, then we're gonna get into, I don't know if Major Mark is gonna play a video on the extra oral exam or not. Um, are you there, Ash? Yeah, I was, honestly, it was kind of boring, so. Okay. Um, so just basically when you're doing your extra oral exam, uh, you wanna make sure like many times you've heard a patient, You've heard that the exam come starts as soon as the patient walks into your operatory. Um, in these times where uh, we may not be able to get a good look at a patient's appearance right away, you can ask them to send you a picture um, via email or, um, and then at that point in time, you can look, get them to do a straight on shot, uh, front shot, and they, you can look to see if there's any swelling. Um, you're looking to see if you can see any so signs of the swelling uh, proceeding down past the angle of the mandible. Do you see any extra oral drainage, which at that point I would really hope we, if, that, if there's extra oral drainage, then we know that the patient is gonna need uh, some intervention. Um, you can ask the patient to touch around their neck region to see if they understand where lymph nodes are located. Um, and again, those are just some of the things that you're going to look for extra orally. When you do an intra oral exam, I believe that it it's the same as when you're doing a phase a phase one exam. You have to have a systematic approach. So start out and look at the bigger picture, and then move in. So based on what the patient has told you, if their pain is on the bottom right, don't just ignore the whole and the rest of the mouth. So do a good soft tissue exam intraorally, um, looking for any um, swelling, any evidence of a um, draining uh, sinus tract. Um, and then what you're going to do is you're going to get into your um, specific exam. And again, right now, um, it is a bit difficult, like um, where ideally you're still gonna may have to uh, modify your exam slightly uh, when you see your patient, but you still need to confirm what your the, what your suspected diagnosis is. So um, to help you out though, um, when you're doing a percussion, uh, if you have the, you can talk the patient through uh, asking them, okay, if if you tap on your teeth, can you can you tell which tooth hurts? And then you can ask them to describe it to you. And you can ask them to run their finger up into the gums. Does anything hurt? And you can ask them to take their two fingers and try to move a tooth back and forth. Like these are all things that you're going to try to gather um, via phone just in these COVID times. However, um, once you have the patient in the chair, you can, um, Sorry, just my computer is saying it's going to restart. <laughs> uh, install. Right. All right. Um, uh, so palpation, again, you want to make sure that you're palpating in the buccal vestibule on the lingual aspect. Uh, make sure uh, if you're going 
on the palate or down towards the floor of the mouth. Make sure that you're doing a thorough palpation. Mobility, uh, just important when you're doing mobility, you can note what scale you're using if you're using the Miller classification. Um, I'll often see plus plus or plus plus plus, but I don't know what that means because I don't know what scale someone's using. So if, if you're using a set scale that's been um, published or identified, then make sure you include that, like mobility using the Miller scale. Probing depth, so um, we all know that isolated deep probing depths can um, often uh, be indicative to a vertical root fracture. Um, however, if it just happened, you're not going to get a deep probing depth that if you have a, vert a true vertical root fracture and it's been long standing and it's led the tooth to necros, um, and uh, um, then you're going to uh, you'll get that deeper probing depth at that point in time. But initially when the tooth potentially just first fractures, you're not gonna get a deep probing depth, but you still have to do your probing. Your cold testing, um, those of you that I've worked with for cold testing, uh, what I do is I always use a number two cotton pellet. Um, oh wait, we have, we have your video on all of this. Oh, I thought you said you weren't gonna play it because it was boring. Well, the the extra the extra roll was pretty boring, but we have the intro ready to rock. Okay. Why don't we show it? Okay, we can if you want. Yeah, absolutely. So here's our clinical exam. Welcome to those folks that have just joined us. Okay. Oh, sorry. What happens? It got deleted. Let me just pull this up. Sorry, folks. Here we go. Reagan, can you see that? Uh, yep. You can see the video now. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a black screen. Is it going now? Yes. Okay, perfect. There's no volume, though. I don't know if there's volume in this. There will be. You just. Help. You want to go through this part? Make sure I can. Yeah. Okay, sure. Like arch. Okay, I want you to open as big as you can and close so there's no limited limitation on opening. Follow down some cervical chain. Okay, that's all I would do for the extra oil. Cool. We're going to start in the maxilla. You can get right in the vestibule too, right? So you can see. That was one of the things I did as a long time ago. I missed a sinus track because I didn't lift the vestibule, you know, look deeply into the vestibule. Good. Who's probing? And what are we looking for? So we're looking for any exudate that may occur. Yep. We are looking for any deep probing depths that may occur. Whether it's generalized or very specific, like for a cracked tooth. Right. And then one way you can do is with your finger, or if you want to be more specific, you can use your use a cotton tip applicator. And we're just looking for any sensitive spots the patient may feel, any sensitivity. Just raise your hand if you have any discomfort, okay? Mm -hmm. Turn towards me a little bit. Again, you can use your finger. Um, I find the cotton belt here is just way more accurate. You can see in there that I have a nice yep. reserve. Just take a number two cotton pellet. And what I'm going to ask to do, <clears throat> the patient to do is raise their hand. Um, 
when they feel the cold and put their hand back down when you don't feel the cold anymore, okay? I'm gonna test a couple of teeth. Uh, for demonstration purposes, I'm not gonna test on the opposite side for this patient, but uh, normally I would um, test on the contralateral side. So the head is important to quantify the baseline. Go ahead. So it's also key to is that if you have a tooth that you, if you suspect it's a specific tooth, then save that tooth to the end. Um, because if it is an irreversible pulpitis, a symptomatic irreversible pulpitis, sorry. Um, once you test that tooth and stimulate it, you may not get a good result for the rest of the teeth for the controls because now that has aggravated the tooth. So again, if you have a in your mind where you suspect a tooth, then save that for the end. That's a really good point, absolutely. Keep your hand up for as long as you hold the cold, or feel the cold, sorry. And then it goes back down when you don't feel the cold anymore. You're trying to see if it's lingering, but you need a baseline to compare to other teeth. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes what I do when the patient says they're super sensitive cold, I'll start on a cusp tip or the inside the ledge and kind of gauge it. And we're not starting with the tooth that's, again, the one that, uh, we're not laser beaming into the onto the uh, the tooth that we suspect is the problem. We're getting our baseline first. Okay, and then I'm going to go to the tooth that we suspect is the problem. Nothing there. <clears throat> Just need to go to the center there. And so when I do percussion, I percuss from the side in the occlusal as well. And I should have another mirror in my kit. Awesome. Okay. So what I want you to do, raise your hand if you have any discomfort, okay? Mm -hmm. That's a good idea doing from the side. Slight there, okay. It looks like you jumped the tooth that we might be. I do, I try to save it to the end because then if the, I find sometimes that the pain receptors Ended up getting fired. It kind of, you, your tests aren't accurate after. And again, I think the, the point that we're trying to make here is you don't laser beam right into that tooth and do that tooth right away, and that's the only tooth that's doing the. Play together and open, play together and open. Together and open. And so you're getting the patients to bite really hard, or what do you? I get what do you ask them? I get them to bite a little bit harder. Okay. I can usually tell and open. And where did you feel that top or bottom? Top. Um. Bite together. Squeeze so right and open. Doing I'm doing the posing. Mm -hmm. Um. When I get them to bite together, I can feel how hard they're biting on the stick. So if I find that they're not biting hard <laughs> enough, I'll direct them to squeeze. Okay. Just going to test over. One where you can use the fiber optics, and we're looking for the transmission of light through the tooth. Ooh, very nice. So, if there's a crack anywhere in that tooth, there's a crack now. Actually, can you see it? Yeah. But it goes right through. Huh. Was that hot? Was yeah. That hot? Oh, okay. So, you got to be careful of heat. So, if there is a crack fracture in the tooth, it will block the transmission of the light. So, that's one option. We also have the the uh, curing light, which is another light. Just be careful of looking at the light. You can see she does have a crack there and it kind of stops the transmission. Oh, it does stop the transmission. I don't know if you can see that on no, your video hard. though. Yeah. So that's another option for translimination and we use that for determining uh, cracked teeth and fractures in teeth. 
Okay, so there are a few ways to, t to test heat, and we typically pull this out occasionally. And one, there are a few different techniques. Uh, Major Metals uses a rubber dam with uh, a mono inject, so rubber dam and then a mono inject full of hot water and have the tooth isolated and splash the tooth with some hot water. Um, you can use um, like a greenie point to create friction on the tooth. That's another mechanism. And another one is using just the uh, the Optura on the system on the elements. So we're just going to test that one tooth and see if we get a response. Just close up a little bit there. I also started using so the fiber optic. The because it creates a lot of heat. So we put a little bit of toothpaste on the tooth and we're going to put a little bit of gutta percha on there. The gutta percha is set to 200 degrees. And let's keep the tip embedded. Because the tip is, you know, not 200 degrees, but probably around 150. And then we're looking for any type of response. So any in response? this case, there's no response. Okay. And we really only pulled and this what out we're when this... that response of C fibers, that dull aching response to, to, to heat. When the patient's chief complaint is heat. Now I'm just gonna throw in here that, you know, what if, what if you have a case like this? So, you know, often you'll, get, you'll go through all those tests, you'll do your cold test, you do your percussion, and they say, I still have pain down on this tooth, but they're not responding to anything. And that is very common, I've had that before. Now the next, one of the, you know, the next thing we didn't show is our EPT. So let's take a look at using our EPT. Okay, we're going to do EPT. So we use this when we're having conflicting results. So we want to confirm necrosis. So the patient has a PFM restoration on this tooth that is in question. So we're going to use a I want you to open the speed to reach up and, and come on to the end of the, the pen. Sorry, one sec. I got two videos playing at the same time. Okay, we're going to do EPT. So we use this when we're having conflicting results. So we want to confirm necrosis. So the patient has a PFM restoration on this tooth that is in question. So we're going to use a I'll just get you to reach up and hold on to the end of the pen. So we're going to use an explorer to conduct the... And the explorer is on natural tooth structure. Yeah. Very important you let go as soon as you feel anything. Okay. okay. We've done that a few times now, so through testing. So we're going to do a few other teeth. And what we do is we get the patient to touch the end of the pen, and then the, they are instructed to release, let go of the pen when you feel something. Mm -hmm. So we've got to make sure that we have toothpaste. some toothpaste, some sort of go conductor. Ahead. And you got to be careful because we can have a significant number of false positives. Mm -hmm. So she stopped at 19. We're not looking for the value. We're just looking to see a relative baseline. We'll do one more at the bottom. This can be really helpful if we try to confirm like a calcific metamorphosis, if it's vital or not, or necrotic. All right. All right, super. So let's just keep going here. What do we got next? So I'm just going to mute. All right, we're just going to keep going here. I don't know who just joined in, but if you can join, if you can just mute your uh, mute your phone for me, that'd be great. So, your phone? Yeah, mute your phone. Hi. Uh, I'm uh, my telephone number is uh, 780 708 one ten fifty two. All right, we got some really key information. All right, Reagan, I just muted. I'm just going to keep going here. Okay. Let's get rid of this. Okay, so let's 
I really appreciate Major Meadows for reviewing that. That's um, it's super helpful. And it's critical to be able to know that if you do have a case, if you do have a case and you're unsure, you can totally email either of us or let, you know, contact us and let us know, because that's really the purpose of all this. So let's continue with our, how does this apply in our military clinics? So this, let's look at a, a couple of key documents. Now, I'm not sure if you all have seen this. Um, if you haven't, email me and I can send it to you. And actually, if you, it'd be interesting to know, it, what's interesting is to see how the transmission of information goes from the top down and if we all get that. So this is the Chief, uh, Chief Dental Officer's interim directive. Uh, it was just released a few weeks ago. And along with that came the dental triage. Now, if you haven't seen this, again, email them. Uh, we're gonna go over this and how it applies to us. And this, is, this document here is very similar to what the ADA has presented. So really, at the, at the start of it, and I would talk with my own deck commander about this. So a symptomatic patient, it's, it's nothing new, we all know this. A patient who presents, so symptomatic with COVID symptoms. A patient who presents with one or more symptoms of COVID-19, if, even if they are mild, including cough, fever, or difficulty in breathing. Now, I've been instructed not to treat these patients in a clinic at all. And I'd like to, I'd be curious to know if, if it has changed for your information. But, you know, at the foundation, we are treating everyone as though they have it to protect, protect ourselves, our employees, and our patients, other patients. But if they do have it, and we know, we're not doing anything to them. No treatment provided. So one of the things that I learned, I watched, and you may have joined, you may have watched it as well by Dr. Glary Glassman, and, Glassman, and this is from his, and I, want, and I was very interested in this, in that it's important to know that there's no scientific evidence at the moment, and this is from Health Canada, that ibuprofen worsens COVID-19 symptoms. Now, why am I putting that in here? Because one of the pharmacological things that we're gonna talk about, and how, I mean, you guys all know, you folks all know um, the first line of medication, ibuprofen and Tylenol and whatnot, we'll review that, but don't think that, you know, I think at, the, at this current evidence now is that you can prescribe ibuprofen for your patients if they have endodontic pain. And it has been indicated that's not going to affect the COVID symptoms. Because just because you have COVID doesn't mean you're not going to have a, a tooth problem. Um, and it really, in that webinar, I suggest you listen to it. Um, why is there controversy talking about it? It's because this French, a French physician tweeted several weeks ago that um, it should be avoided. And there's a fallout, a bunch of social media things that came along with it. But really the point is, is that it, at right now there's no hard science evidence that it affects the outcome with COVID. So really, um, this was gonna be talking about asking the right questions during the endodontic interview. Because we're gonna be doing this from on teledentistry to start, but then we're gonna be seeing them in our clinics as well. It's important to really get down to the right questioning. And Doc, um, Major Meadows has talked about a few of those, and this is our classic case. So this is our patient, and if, you know, if you've, done this already, I really appreciate your comments at the end. You know, the patient's gonna be calling into the clinic and saying, I've got this toothache, that's, you know, there's nothing new there. But it's really the questions and the specific questions and how you can provide them advice, provide them analgesia over the phone is how maybe it might actually impact the success of the way the patient is managed before you need to see them. So, this uh, was shared with me by uh, Major Meadows, and there is a COVID-19 uh, task force tiger team. That's, I love the name, word tiger team, but it's uh, been stood up by Major um, Maxine Fournier, and he is reviewing all the research and all these little algorithms and whatnot. And Major Meadows has sent this to me. I'm not sure if you've seen it. This is from um, Reagan. This is from the Nova Scotia Dental Board. That's correct. And it's very simple and it's nothing different than what the CDO is talking about. So we're staying in line with what the Chief Dental Officer is suggesting. We're just, it, this is a really clear way of doing it. So really, as we know, you know, step one is interview the patient over the phone to determine the nature of the concern. If it's not an emergency, take their contact information, reschedule the patient when, you, when our office opens. If it's deemed to be a true emergency and cannot be managed pharmacologically, we need to proceed, proceed to step two. We all know that. So what we're going to do is we really need to talk about what are we looking for? What are we asking with them on the phone? So some options that you can do is FaceTime. 
Uh, it's really simple or any type of, you know, images like your Meadows had, had talked about. And you know what, Mike, um, I had a patient who was really interesting. She had an, a bracket, a, a bracket that came off and I was like, how do, I can't really see it with your fingers. So her daughter suggested she use spoons as uh, retractors. So here's my son. Okay, put them down. Using retractors. Are shading your head. There we go. Turn one down. So it's a really simple way you can get your patients to be able to see the bigger picture if they need to send you some photos. So you just take some spoons, make sure they wash their hands. And then I'm trying to tell Michael to open, bite down and move the things around, the spoons, there we go. So you can get the patient to move around and it gives you a better, you know, a better image of what, he's not doing a very good job, that's an eight year old, but it gives you an idea of what is possible. So what are some of the questions, you know, so, let me step back. So the primary dental triage should really focus on the provision of the three A's. And this is from the NHS. Again, anything I'm saying is in line with what we're following with the chief dental officer. This is just adjuncts that are some really neat ideas that I've learned. So providing advice to them because they're going to be looking to you because even this morning I got a, a call from an, a lady who used to take care of her kids. And it's, you know, they're, they're looking for advice because you are the expert. 100%. And if you don't have the answer, you know, contact this community to get an answer, to, to try to help you work through it. You're not alone. And I think that's the beauty of working together as a military family is that you're not alone. So we're going to be providing them analgesia up front and then any microbials. Now, it's important to note that if you're going to be prescribing any, any type of medication, you need to, you need to, as a provider, need to follow up in that 24 to 48 hour window to see if it's actually working. So some of the questions that you can ask them, and this is an updating thing, and it was very interesting because I fall, so I looked, I Googled uh, telemarketing dentistry, and this is from some company in the States. And these are the questions that they're asking. And I don't know if we have a list of these, but it's gonna be ongoing and changing, as you know. I went to Costco yesterday, I had my mask on, but there are people walking around with masks, and now the chief uh, medical officer suggested that masks can help. So asking somebody if they've gone to China now is not really that relevant because we know it's pretty hard to get to China and get back. Even on a boat, it's not going to be in 14 days. However, they might be in big, you know, in groups in grocery stores where aerosols and micro droplets, I'm not going to talk about that because I don't have enough knowledge about that, but they might be walking through clouds of um, COVID-19 that they might be getting. So it might be you know, it might be useful to ask them, have they been part, you know, you can see down the road here in this document here, have you come in contact with people who've traveled to Italy and China? That's a fairly standard question we've been asking, but there are at least two people documenting experience of fever within the last 14, 14 days you've been in contact with. And have you recently participated in any gathering meetings or close contact with others in large gatherings showing symptoms? You know, it's slowly changing. We know and the evidence is showing that asymptomatic people might be carrying it. So I think, you know, really update your questions because they might allow you to get a better feel if they're symptomatic or if you need to see if it's safe to see them. So this is another, um, this is actually shared by the Tiger team head, uh, Major Fournier. He sent it to me. It's not part of the Chief Dental Officer um, document yet and i don't know if it is but what i like about it and i'll email this to you afterwards it's a really it's from the nova scotia board and major meadows shared it with me it walks you right through what to do it really it's not and it, and that's what i we all know what to do but we don't know when to do it or how to do it we all know that we're supposed to talk about teledentistry but some people are doing it differently some people are doing it here and i when i email it i'd like to get your thoughts about it and see how does this work. Reagan, do you have any points about this? Um, so it's it's fairly straightforward um, and it's it pretty much explains what we normally do anyway. We manage pain with ibuprofen. If you're not getting any improvement, you add an adjunct such as acetaminophen. You will note in there that there isn't any um, narcotics at this point in time. Um, for people that aren't licensed in certain provinces, it can be difficult to prescribe narcotics. Um, however, um, different areas have developed different work workarounds. So you'll have to see 
what the workaround is in your clinic or within your province. Uh, for instance, Nova Scotia is now allowing um, registered dentists of Nova Scotia to call in narcotic prescriptions before it used to have to go on a triplicate pad. So I, the, this was developed so without narcotics in mind to see if we could try to manage pain uh, without any narcotics. Um, and then it jumps down to um, antibiotic uh, therapy as well. Um, Major Mark and I've had many discussions about using antibiotics to treat an irreversible papitis, but at this point in time, uh, it's being recommended, even though potentially the science, it's, it goes against a lot of the things that we have learned um, because antibiotics can't necessarily treat an irreversible pulpitis. Um, however, there's been some evidence that shows it has worked in certain circumstances. But um, the other thing is that I've, a lot of the clinics that in Nova Scotia, um, and I know this is not military specific, but they will, you can't be treated in an emergency dental clinic uh, unless you're having problems swallowing, breathing, um, you have a compromised airway, that's a different story. But what the clinics are wanting you to do that have been deemed as an emergency clinic, um, they want you to go through this algorithm before going through and providing treatment. And so the chief dental officer has given directive is us, we want to try to manage everything pharmacologically first prior to tr seeing that patient. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great, a great point. And um, anecdotally, I've seen I've had uh, referrals for endo, and it's it's remarkable that the general this is a civilian practice that they'll get the patient will have irreversible symptoms, hundred percent, and then they're given antibiotics, and literally within twenty four hours, it's solved. Now I'm kind of like, that goes against what I've been told. I'm not. This is not Major Mark saying you need you will be doing this. Is not. This is just my anecdotal experience. Whether or not it's just the pulp dying and it was at a certain point, I'm not sure. Were the antibiotics not, were they working or not? I don't know. But I think at this point, it's important for you to not say, Major Mark told me to do this, but it's more like just to think that there's an opportunity that in this time we might need to do a different experience. One last point is that more, a lot of our providers are not from the same province, so that you know the, the, the pharmacotherapy with narcotics is an important statement. Major Buckley, our oral surgeon here, talked about uh, he, uh, I guess he's a real cowboy and redneck when he's taking teeth out. So he had lots of problems with Saturday calls. And I'm only joking. But um, what he would use is Toradol. So um, it was, I'll email that out because I have it up on the screen, but I can't see my comments. So it's roughly 10 milligrams for a certain number of days. And I can send that to you. Uh, because it, he said that it was an effective way to manage uh, medicaid manage if it's the next level above NSAIDs, so the you know combination of ibuprofen and tonal the next level that he uses is uh, toradol it's uh, 10 milligrams every six hours um, and give 20 tabs and but you would stop all your other analgesics the other one you could add on is tramadol it's 50 to 100 milligrams every four to six hours, a maximum of 400 milligrams per day. Um, tramadol works on the mu receptors, but it's not considered um, a narcotic at this point in time. So those are two adjuncts that you could add to your um, toolbox. Awesome. Thank you so much, Regan. Okay, so we've gone through this, uh, the questioning review. Uh, so we're gonna skip right through this. So we've talked about antibiotics and normally, in a normal situation, we only prescribe them for fever, malaise, and lymphadenopathy and immunocompromise. However, it might change to the point where you might, might need to, it might be indicated that you need to use them. So let's walk through, uh, if you haven't seen, if you've read the, if the Chief Dental Officer's directive, I wanted to just walk through doing a couple clinical procedures. So we're coming up on a on one hour, I need some sort of eye candy. So this is um, Ottawa Carling Dental Clinic, the new waiting room. So if you imagine the indicate, so the way it works now is that the dental provider uh, meets greets the patient with a mask and gl glasses on, and then the patient immediately 
um, uses an alcohol ABHR, which I just learned was alcohol-based hand rub, and is, and is given two masks. That's why there's two pictures here. So the, the patient is, is taken to the dental operatory and then with the mask on. And again, symptomatic patients with COVID symptomatics, you, symptomatic patient, you, there's no treatment. However, what we right now in the directive, a high risk situation is uh, deemed with an aerosol generating procedure, an asymptomatic patient and not in self isolation. So that could be walking around in Costco like myself yesterday. And no contact with a symptomatic patient in the last 14 days. So that's a high risk. So anything high risk goes under that. And a low risk situation is essentially what you can read there. So it's indicated as well in, the, in that directive that unless you have doors on your operatory, you cannot treat patients with that fall into that high risk situation. There's probably upcoming ideas about using the MDCs and using um, you know, barriers and whatnot, but at this moment, uh, you can't do that. So this one point about aerosols that I wanted to mention, and this is from the New England Journal of Medicine, it's that it's, and it's important to understand this, and we've all seen this in the media, but I just wanna review it. Uh, there, the most recent evidence shows that when the virus becomes suspended in droplets smaller than five micrometers and with aerosol, it can susp be suspended for about half an hour. And then it settles down on surfaces and it can linger for hours. The virus stayed suspended for three hours, but it would drift around. And I think it's important to understand that because when we're creating these aerosols, it's super important to make sure that um, there's, we limit the number of viral particles in that aerosol. So like Major Meadows had talked about, the most two common endodontic procedures that we're going to see is going to involve either a volatile pulp with irreversible pulpitis, so with or not percussion pain, let's just cut it to that, or a necrotic pulp, a dead tooth, with or, with, with or without um, apical periodontitis, or an acute apical abscess. So we've, going through the clinical procedures, we've done our pharmacotherapy, we've Prescribe them, the patient presents, I've got her calls, I've got lots of pain in my upper left tooth. Okay, well, you know, send me a picture. Um, here's the medication we can do. I'll prescribe that over the phone, or you can go into the pharmacy and get it. Call them in 24 hours, it's still hurting. Okay, well, let's follow, you know, you follow it through again. Let's throw in some antibiotics. Let's try that. Yes, it might not be indicated. Major Mark's not saying do that. But what if all of that, you know, we've filled that, we've completed that checklist and it's still not effective? And we need to see the patient. So we get the patient back to the back to the chair. We sit them down. We take off their mask. And the first thing we're going to do is get them to rinse with hydrogen peroxide as low as one point. You know, the recommendation right now from the CDO is 1.5% hydrogen peroxide rinse. They spit that into the cup and throw it in the sink. And then you're going to do your clinical examination. This is Captain Smiley, of okay. course. Go ahead. Can I just put something in? Yeah. At this time, according to the, the directives that we've received, is that we are not supposed to start any procedures, though, until we have the go-ahead from the CO. So if you have a patient where you suspect that you're going to have to initiate um, non-surgical root canal therapy, you have to engage your chain of command to ensure that uh, we've get, been given the go-ahead to proceed. Um, I'll just chime in. It's DCOS. Um, so I'll admit I'm doing three things at once. So I'm kind of listening from one ear and doing other things on the side, but I did uh, feel like I wanted to inject. It's great stuff happening. Uh, thanks so much for doing this. Um, it's with regards to the, if you don't have a closed operatory for aerosols, the caveat here is that when, you know, patients do need care, but they don't quite fit in the CDO's guidelines at this point, those are the ones that your debt commanders are going to reach back to the DCO to discuss because we'll, we may have to find like a, a gray zone to work around certain solutions. So it's not like 100% no, but these are cases that are going to be brought up to my attention on a case by case, some of which I'll discuss with the CO and so on. Same for the case that do fit the CDO's guidance. Uh, if you guys have the closed room, they, you've done your, uh, uh, your decision making for each step when you're answering all the questions and you've got the right PPE, those I don't need to hear about, but it's more the ones that can't fall within the CDO's guidance at this point that 
headquarters wants to uh, provide some assistance. So that's all I wanted to clarify. Is there any questions? Yeah, ma'am, that's a great, I really, really appreciate injecting. So one of the questions we've got a lot of captains and some majors, I would, I think it would be recommended that before they do any treatment, I'm sure it's happening right now, they connect with their debt commander and review the case before any type of procedure is started. For sure. Yeah. Any, any of those for sure at the death level, it, it's too new and, you know, we don't know how much training and review has been done on the SOP. So for sure at the local level, please confirm everything's a green light. Your debt commander will know though that beyond that points, if they have any doubt, they can always contact us that the door is always open, but we do kind of give the caveat green light that they can proceed if it's within the CDO's guidance. And otherwise, for sure, they need to reach back to us. All right, super. Thank you so much. So, some pretty good points. Um, so, we're going to continue with our clinical exam. So, you've gotten the green light to see the patient. You haven't gotten the green light to do an aerosol generating procedure. However, you need to collect your information, your data before you present that. And that's why we want to, you know, this is actually there's a very timely discussion by Colonel Boussier because. We want to make sure that we have the right information, the exact information. So the question I would ask potentially as a DCO is, do you know what's that tooth specifically, or is it referred from the from the opposing arch? And then you sit back and think, ah, I didn't do the, I didn't collect that information. I forgot to. Make sure you go through that ex perfect clinical exam so you can provide that information right up front so the decision can be made. So you're not missing anything because then we're exposing ourselves, a patient, and your entire staff to uh, potential for COVID infection. So we've gotten the green light. Now we're going to either do a, a pulpectomy or we're going to do a pulpotomy. Obviously, we're going to be doing um, rubber dam, and it's important for the rubber dam to be placed and because it will limit the aerosol production. So one of the things, and as an adjunct, for any of these procedures, you can use a secondary seal. So this is just a simple way that I was shown to place a rubber dam around the clamp. This is just for, we're gonna do a pulp, a pulp, a, an endo on this tooth, using my perio probe just to move that rubber dam off the clamp. You can use your fingers, but sometimes it's frustrating. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use opal dam or oro seal or anything like that. And we're trying to minimize the contact of saliva into onto the tooth surface and then that just gets sprayed all over the place with your aerosols so we do that we like cure it and then i was listening to gary glassman he had a really good point after you know you've got everything set up take your bleach you could use hydrogen peroxide as well i don't see why not but use something full strength or or uh, hyd um, hydrogen peroxide and scrub that tooth for approximately 30 seconds to a minute just to make sure you kill all the viral particles, any bacteria, whatnot, on that tooth to limit the spread of um, this virus. So I have this image here because there's gonna be the time when you need to extract teeth and you're seeing an extraction with a rubber dam. I don't know if you've done it before. I've started routinely doing it. This is another way to, you know, you can't use it in every situation, but I'll tell you, it makes life so much easier. We can talk about that another time, but it's just another idea to try to limit those aerosols. Because we all know if you have to take a tooth out, if it's indicated and it's root canal, it's not coming out in one piece. It's coming out in probably a million. So let's talk about the pulpotomy procedure. Now there are some indications. It's a really effective way, very simple, it's fast to to re relieve a patient's symptoms uh, in a vital tooth. So the successful pulpotomy is really, you know, it's gonna work almost 90% of the time with symptomatic, with patients with, you know, they've got irreversible pulpitis, but there's no percussion pain and there's vital tissue present in the pulp. So this is a pulpotomy procedure. Let me just walk you through it. So you can see, this is uh, actually a friend of mine. We're just doing the the last part of the diagnosis, it was a cracked tooth with no restorations. They happen freak, more frequently than you can imagine. This is a posterior tooth. And we're gonna, the next case section, the next lectures we're gonna be talking about going through this procedures. Uh, but we're gonna hop into this pulp chamber. Now it dropped in quickly with this number, number six, number four, large round burr because 
It's an open pulp chamber from the radiograph. We hop in there. I just make a single little dent. There's lots of different ways to do your endo access. You can make the outline. This is what I wanted to do in this case is drop right in so I can do my interpulpal if I need to because we're using back pressure. So I've got a small hole. He didn't feel anything. There's vital tissue in there. And all I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take my endo zebra. And it's really hard to do this with, you know, if there's pulp stones and calcifications, but in those cases where it's literally an open pulp chamber, you can take that endo zebra, place it right on the pulp floor. You can't see anything because essentially I can't see anything while I'm doing this. You don't need to because it's a non-cutting tip. There's how long it took to get that access we'll take a look in the mirror once so i bring my mirror and boom our pulpotomy is essentially done now this tooth oh gosh now that tooth was essentially necrotic uh, but that outlies the let me just pause that here so you can see if you can can you see my uh my pointer here reagan you can see your mouse. You can see my mouse. Perfect. Yeah. So you can see this is, in this case, this was partially necrotic. You can see that the distal canal, when I was removing it, it kind of fluffed. I don't know if that's the right word, but it just kind of, it was detached. Now, in that case, that's not a really good, that's not a situation for a pulpotomy. And this was, but the part of the procedure is that's how fast it is. So what you would do is you take, so you take your endo explorer, take a look, see if any of that, that material detaches and if it does then you can do it you know if it's partially necrotic the idea and i've done this before you can do a partial pulpotomy remove this necrosis tissue from the distal canal if these mesial canals are still vital all you got to do is rinse this out with some hypochlorite leave those canals untouched place uh you know you can use a dry cotton pellet the evidence shows it doesn't matter what you put on your cotton pellet we'll put a you can even put eugenol on the cotton pellet, place that in there, and then place your, your triage or your more permanent temporary restoration and you're done. So the key is to make sure that it's not necrotic because what's gonna happen is if that tooth is necrotic, it's not gonna work on those partial pulpotomy, on the pulpotomy. So the protocol for a pulpotomy is really profound anesthesia. Reconfirm before you start with cold. There's I know that whoever's on the line still, that when you go to do a filling or a root canal, you get to a certain part of the tooth and the patient's like, oh, and I'll tell you that slows down, that slows the steam train, the steam engine from keeping down the road of getting that procedure done effectively. And one of the simplest ways you can make sure that your procedure goes well is to cold test after you do your anesthesia. For, uh, you know, for a root canal or extraction, I'll do minimum of three, three mandibular blocks with a long buckle. We'll, we're gonna get into that next section, um, but make sure you cold test with cold to make sure that they don't feel anything. It builds up your confidence and it builds up the patient's confidence. And you know what? It actually builds your dental assistant's confidence because then they're not running around doing that. Oh, you need more um, lidocaine. So again, so the next step is access and confirm that the tooth is vital. If there, you get some detached I'll say because you still will get a cold positive in some partially necrotic teeth. It's ridiculous, but it has happened. So if it's necrotic, you've got to do the pulpectomy. You're going to irrigate with your hypochlorite, dry the canals, dry if it's partial, dry that one canal or dry the pulp chamber. Place a dry cotton pellet then just by itself, or you can place with a cotton pellet with eugenol. Eugenol seems to be some sort of effective in sedating the, the rest of the nerve that's remaining. Place a restoration of triage or Fuji 2, and then you're going to follow up in 24 hours to make sure that that procedure was effective. But we're not all trained on pulpotomies. I get it. And you're not always confident because sometimes it's like, ah, oh, it worked, it didn't work. Well, next step is a pulpectomy. Now, this is a video here. It's not for this, but it really talks about a premolar. And I've seen this a number of times. I've done it myself. Let's just watch and see what it says. Ash here, and here's a case just from today, and I wanted to, I've got a video that I'm producing. It takes me about uh, three or four days to produce a video, but this is a topic that I really wanted to talk about was bicuspids and kind of orifice, uh, finding the pulp horns in orifice and kind of a couple of hints. So in this case, this is, we're talking about tooth number 2-4, um, and it's tooth number 12, 
and what this is is this tooth was diagnosed as sorry it was diagnosed <laughs> with some of, I'm so excited was diagnosed as necrotic with asymptomatic apical peritonitis. So it was referred to me to, to complete the endo. And this turns out, and I should have seen it earlier, but this turns out it's actually porcelain. So I see it now, the, the eluding cement, but initially I thought it was a composite. So when I started to access, it was like, oh, this is porcelain, which is not a big deal. So we just switched burrs to a diamond. And the tip that I want to talk about today was um, just getting into the canals and location of the orifices. So this is just through the porcelain a little bit. And we got into a little bit of dentin, maybe about a millimeter into dentin, and we're not looking, finding any pulp chamber, which is totally fine. We're going to be a little bit deeper. And what we're trying to do is conserve uh, coronal dentin. So we don't want to go, I mean, it could blow through here and find it, no problem. But we're just trying to be a little more conservative. And what you see here is the dark spot. And in the, the basic, or this, the root canal course, the secrets, root canal secrets, I talk about looking for the dark spot. So if you have high magnification with loops, you'll be able to see, and this is where you want to tread light or track towards uh, where this is, this dark spot. And you can actually change how this looks. This is dry, but if you add a little, excuse me, a little bit of water to it, it'll actually make it even darker. So what I did at this point, this is using a small high-speed friction grip number two round burr. Uh, so I got into dentin about a millimeter, and then I found this. So I know to track slowly towards this. This I'm not too happy about, so I'm going to kind of stay away from this white. Uh, but I'm looking for along this ridge, and this is calcified pulp tissue right here, and so is that right there. So one of the things, before I get to the next image, is it's that this review article in 2016, and what it talks about is that um, the root canal morphology of maxillary first premolars, and this is a first premolar. Now, I'll cut to the chase. Uh, maxillary pre um, premolars are predominantly two rooted teeth with two root canals, and that's the important point. So, essentially, what they found, a number of uh, articles that they found, study, is that regardless of the number of roots, the vast majority, so almost 87%, had two root canals. And that, again, that's regardless of the number of roots. So one or two roots, 87% had two root canals. So when you get to, this is now we've gotten into the pulp chamber, into one of the pulp horns, like here. So this this is the buckle, and this is, this is a three-rooted premolar, but it's the same idea. So we've kind of nicked the pulp horn, and you can see, obviously, it's necrotic. And I know that 80% of the time, 87% of the time, there's going to be two root canals. So I'm going to, if I only, because I've seen this happen before, and this is before actually one of my endodontist friends had talked to me about this, was if you take your file immediately and put in the, put your file in here, it's probably going to come come out kind of this way. It's hard to, it's in 3D, hard to, hard to push, show you in 3D. But if you look down with your high with your high magnification loops, um, what you're going to find is that if we divide the tooth into half, so this is the buckle and this is the palate, we divide it right down the middle. You're probably going to only have one chamber. You know, it's going to you have one chamber, but it's going to look like it's a little more to the buckle. So what you what you need to do, it's not what you can do. It's what you need to do is to find where that other canal is, because we know again, 87% of the time they're going to have two root canals. So some clues here. This is a dried pulp chamber, but if you wet it, what's going to happen is you see this brown. This is calcified pulp tissue. So the actually, so I want to stay away from this white. And and if I'm drawing a line from the buckle cusp to the palatal cusp, it's going to be kind of tracking like this, and it kind of tracks it right there. It actually kind of goes more like here. So. If we look here, the initial one, and here, what I've done is I slow down my handpiece so you can i have an electric we have electric handpieces in one clinic so i slowed down the rpm and so use the same burr the number two long surgical length burr i slowed it down to 5,000 rpms and just slowly brushed along this material here and it opens up this isthmus and where the other palatal canal is you can see i'm not very happy with where i've dinged it see this this right here is this and i'm not happy because you can see it on the x-ray uh, but it's always a learning learning experience. So what so what you do is you again you 
So the real point that I wanted to bring up here is that as providers, now we're in a time where we can't afford, we need to do it right the first time. And you're not perfect and you're gonna make mistakes, but these are bicuspids. And I've seen this over and over and over again where one of the canals was missed. And I'll be honest, when you're brand new as a dental officer, as a dentist, you're like, yes, I got into that tooth. Woo, good to go. Um, and you know, honestly, you really need to just sit back and think, okay, well, I've got a, a maxery bicuspid. There should be two canals. Take a slow speed, take your endo zebra, take anything to try to, if you've got, like I said, if you've got that one, you know, one orifice on half, the other side of the tooth, especially by cuspids, because that's what we really feel comfortable treating. Look for something else, because what's going to happen is you'll do your treatment, but then you're going to have to come back again and see the patient. So I've shared with this, this little cheat sheet with you, you know, take it, print it, take it with you, put it on your phone, because there are some little hints in here that you need to take a look at. And I would ask you to, before you go ahead and treat a, a tooth these days, is you know how many times does a second maxillary premolar have two canals? It's important to know this stuff because you don't want to have to go back. So let's just talk about a, a maxillary or a mandibular pulpectomy. This is, again, this is probably the third lecture we're gonna be talking about, but this is more just how the procedure should happen because Major Meadows and I have seen pulpectomies, I've done them myself. Forget it. I've done it myself with a 15 file and that patient is back the next day with a lot of pain. We need to make sure that we open up that tooth to get our ear against down to our, our apical constriction, get all that vital tissue. If it's a vital tooth that you're doing this in, get all that vital tissue out of there because it's gonna be even more irritated. Not only have you with a 10 file stabbed it and poked it and prodded it and made it super unhappy, you've made it even a worse situation than it might have had been before. So that's what we really, in, our, in the end of course, and what we're gonna talk about here is opening, cleaning and shaping to a primary or some sort of uh, rotary file. So let's just go, this is even before we found our working leg. We know that most teeth are 19 to 21 millimeters long. This is the wave one gold primary. And what I'm doing is I'm opening it to, if you can see it, I'm taking it to the coronal part of the flute. So we know that that's 16 millimeters. I wish I could not have to do that. We know that we know, oh my gosh, I'm super sorry about that. I'll just let that run. So we know that on a root canal file, the cutting flutes are standardized at 16 millimeters long. And a simple way to get irrigants, to get rid of those coronal problems with uh, binding our file and trying to get a working length is if we can get rid of that. So what I'm doing at this point is I'm cleaning and shaping the coronal two thirds and I'm actually doing, or you know, I'm opening the orifice and cleaning and shaping. What I'm gonna do next is, so you can see it just in the distal, distal canal there. The beauty of uh, Wave on Gold is that you can bend it in different shapes to help you get in there. So I'm not going- Can you pause your video for a sec? Oh, I hope I can. Okay. And, just to reiterate, like at this point in time, um, Major Mark hasn't even tried to find working length um, with an apex locator. All we're trying to do is enlarge that coronal two thirds. Um, so that's all I wanted to say in that that's part. That's a great point. And if you really want to be safe, because you just saw me take a rotary file down the canals without any hand files. I know that's going through the mind of right 90% of the people. Actually, I'm, as I'm seeing me do that, I can't believe I'm doing that. What we do recommend on the end of course, and what we talk, uh, what we mentor is to take a hand file, 6, 8, 10, hand file. Make sure you have, you know, no binding in that coronal two thirds. So don't take the, you know, take your hand file to the 60 millimeters. Make sure you, you've got the canals open and then off you go. We're trying to really make this simple. So we're gonna irrigate with full strength hypochlorite. If you're doing your pulpectomies, I recommend using a 10 millimeter syringe as well to get the patient out of pain, but also one of the biggest tips that I've been taught by endodontists over and over again is make sure you have a stable reference point. So take the endo zebra, if it's a regular tooth, you can see I, I nicked the, uh, the rubber dam. I'm gonna to have to change that out. So make sure you have a stable reference point because then you can make sure your working lengths are exact every time and you're not over instrumenting and creating more problems. So we're gonna change this rubber dam out. 
and we've got our new rubber dam on there. And now I'm gonna work, check for working length. So I've opened, I clean and shaped the coronal two thirds. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take, nowadays I typically start with a six, six file, but you can go to an eight and I'll work up to a 10. I'm getting my working length. I'm gonna do a little bit of cleaning, a little bit of um, what we call smoothies or glide path fabrication. So we're gonna do that in all the, all the canals. And literally, once you start getting good at this, it's only gonna take you half an hour, even 20 minutes to do your pulpectomy. You wanna do this efficiently without any monkeying around. And CEO brought up some really good points of, you know, if you haven't set up your endo stuff yet, go and do it. Get in there, set up your, and we're gonna, I actually have a video by Captain Mansuri from the endo course going over. He's a really funny guy. So he goes over the entire setup that we recommend that's really basic and simple to do this procedure. So it's ready to rock when you need it. So I've figured out my working lengths. Now I'm gonna take this, the Wave and Go primary. So it's a 2507 uh, file. So the apical three millimeters of that file have an 07 taper. It's, and it's a 20, 25 millimeter tip. I'm gonna take that to length. And what you see me do now is I'm taking it down slowly. And as I, so I have the pulp chamber full of liquid of sodium hypochlorite. I take the, take the file down, don't stop it, but that's uh, the hand piece that we have. Uh, that's a little longer discussion. So I'm taking the file down, I'm pulling it out and I'm actually dropping all the debris and the fluids into the, into the fluid in the chamber. So if you don't want to do that, I recommend after every two passes, so kind of down, back, down, back, get your, bring it out, clean the fluids. Because if the, if the file is filled with debris, it's not cutting, it's actually making more friction and increases the probability of fracturing your file. So let me say that again. As you see me pull the file out, I'm actually just kind of dropping the debris into the pulp chamber. The pulp chamber is almost full of sodium hypochlorite and I'm going back down. So that serves two purposes. It empties the flutes, but it also takes more hypo down with it, because that's what we want. You know, we want motor oil down in there to lubricate the, the entire uh, canal system. And then we're gonna irrigate, because irrigation serves two purposes. It, one, it serves to get rid of all the junk out of the way, but it also serves to disinfect. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna reconfirm my working lengths with a 10 file. When you, you know, in these multi-rooted teeth, it's important to make sure that when you root, you know, you check your working lengths, make sure there's no irrigant in your in the pulp chamber because it acts like it's just a connector connecting everything and your, your apex locator is gonna be screaming all over the place, you're gonna get frustrated. I'm gonna talk about that down in, in the next lecture series. So we've cleaned the shape to just a 2507. You can use whatever file you want. But you didn't see me, you know, stab at it with a 10 file. You didn't see me stab at it with a 15 or a 20. I wanted to make sure I got most of that pulp tissue out of there. We're going to clean that. We're going to dry it. I place all the paper points into all the, the um, into the, or in the canals. Place some air. I just whip some air. So now, oh, that's a really interesting point right there. And that's one of the benefits of using calcium hydroxide. You can see that. That isthmus, so there's this is the distal canal. There's an isthmus between the two canals. So essentially it's a ribbon shaped, if you may, but there's an isthmus there. And the beauty of calcium hydroxide is that it not only kills bacteria, but it also dissolves tissue. So when I went back in and finished this case, you can talk about this later, you could see all of that tissue come flying out of there because it was dissolved by the calcium hydroxide. So before we, before we place our calcium hydroxide, we're gonna make sure that everything's dry let's go back to where we were so the reason why again i'm doing this i place all my paper points into every orifice because we don't want to have an, a, a potential emphysema if that's possible in, in uh, osseous tissue i'm going to take my air water syringe i'm going to blow on top of that and what that does is it wicks it blows all the pulp tissue all the pulp chamber irrigant into those paper points and it dries everything perfect so there's that distal canal with that with the uh, with that little fin, there's our mesial canals are opened up. You can see I'm looking for I've looked a little bit for me, the middle mesial, but that's not important during the pulpectomy stage. So the next stage is just to place some calcium hydroxide. There's different ways to do it, but I'll tell you the simplest way that I found is just to place fill full not full but place it in the pulp chamber, 
take a ten file down, put your work, you know, your your rubber stop to your working length, and just pump that ten file up and down. Get it in up and down the chamber. That's the quickest and easiest way and the most effective. And one of the reasons why we want to do that to make it efficient and effective is that once we start packing it down the canal, there's always a probability of extruding it out the can out the apical port. And if you get that on into a sinus or you get it onto an inferior alveolar nerve, patient's got to come back for even more. So what you're seeing here is I'm not going to use a cotton pellet because I'm not really a fan of the little firewalls coming up. The cotton pellet just serves to, to keep space. So I'm using the calcium hydroxide to actually maintain that space. And that's our pulpectomy procedure. We like cure it, and then we're done. So that is that. Can I say something, Major Mark? Absolutely. Um, just when you're putting your calcium hydroxide down, if you use a 10 file, make sure it's a sterile 10 file that you have used in the canal system previously. Um, and then um, Major Mark and I had a bit of a discussion about with regards to the type of temporary restoration you want to put in there. Um, these patients are potentially going to be in their temporaries at this time because of COVID. Um, these patients are going to be in their temporaries a little bit longer. Um, so another possibility would be um, a composite restoration. Uh, a bonded composite restoration, Fuji uh, 2LC will bond if you use the cavity condition. Uh, so don't be using cavit or IRM. Um, I don't know if any of you still use that, but just think that these need to be long-term temporaries. Uh, we try to preach to, uh, to people that um, ideally you want cuspal coverage on some of these molars teeth as quick as possible. You're just going to have to explain to your patient just to still take it easy on those on those teeth for uh, for now um, until we can get them back in for more definitive treatment. Yeah, and that's all I have. Yeah, that's a really good point. Is that and I've started doing that. Uh, and generally, is if it's if you have a diagnosis of a crack, you know, reduce it and then tell the patient you got to go easy on this tooth if we want to save it, but also to prevent you from coming back in. So you know, essentially, even a lower Reduction of the cusp, almost I would say three, four millimeters. Get that right out of their bite. Tell them to not bite on it. They won't be for a while. But what's going to happen is that once the pain goes away, they're going to start be like, oh, everything's good to go. And then boom, they bite on a nut or a, a beer bottle or something, and then it cracks a little bit more. Now they're back in pain, and we might not be able to see them yet. So I really appreciate that point, Reagan. So next week, so I really appreciate your time. We're going to open it up for any questions. I just want to let you know that next week we're going to be talking about um, more appropriate anesthesia tech tips. So you saw Major Fernandez showing the X tip, and we're going to do some PDL stuff. Um, I sent you that article, so review that in terms of uh, how to better prepare yourself and achieve adequate, incredible anesthesia. That art, the article. Uh, if you didn't receive it, please email me and then I'll send it to you. And we're gonna talk about looking at radiographs. So uh, with that, what I'm gonna do is I really appreciate your time and thank you so much, Reagan, for uh, the discussion. If you have any points, just unmute yourself or chat and then uh, let's ask some questions. All right, so let me just- uh, Mr. Park. Yeah, go ahead, there we go. Hi, this is Captain Kim. Um, I wanted to ask about the high rate of false positives that you were talking about with the EPT. Yeah. Uh, is that due to electrical conduct conduction uh, from the current, the uh, soft tissue through saliva? I mean, I and mean, Reagan can chime in here as well, or anybody else. My experience has been, and the, I mean, there's a plethora of articles that talk about this. I mean, since you've got a, a conducting media uh, medium of saliva, so, you know, the, 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 the adjacent tooth could be picking up um, some of the electrical current. The gingiva can be, I mean, I've had all different types. And I think uh, one of the important points is that if you can't come to a perfect answer, you don't need to do anything. The patient, it's only teeth. It's not like their limb is falling off. You don't need to do a procedure unless you know 100% that that is exactly the tooth you're working on. Um, my experience has been that, you know, I've been doing this in private practice for now six years, 
and that I need to make sure 100% that that is the tooth. And if it isn't, the patient is totally okay for me to say, I can't come to 100%. Let's get you back. We're going to follow up with you in a week because they don't want to pay for a tooth that they didn't need a root canal in. Our military pers- military clinic is entirely is very similar, but they're more willing to take a bit of a risk. I think in this point now, it's important for you to make sure that, and that's a really good point, that yes, there are false positives. And if you can't get 100% after you, you've exhausted all your clinical tests, just stop record everything you have and follow up the next day in 48 hours and then carry on, you know, until you can get, because teeth, honestly, my experience has been teeth, if they're vital, they become irreversibly inflamed, they become necrotic and the patient becomes like, oh, I don't need a root canal now. It's those other ones where they're necrotic, then they might become an apical abscess. Those are more of the issues. Uh, Reagan, do you have any points on that? Um. The EPT can be tricky to use. Um, I find that I mainly use the EPT to confirm necrosis, and I nine times out of ten I will not get a false positive when I'm looking at that. Um, so basically, I'm putting the EPT on the tooth that I'm pretty much bang on, 100% sure that it is necrotic, but I just want that other confirmation. And that's usually the only time that I'll bring out the EPT. Okay, thank you very much. Does that answer your question? It does, sir. Right, so I've got I've got another question from Wang. Um, what would you recommend if the patient has generalized pulp calcification such that many of the teeth, including the tooth of interest, does not respond to cold or EPT? Let's say the tooth of interest shows biting pain but has normal apical periodontium. Well, I think I kind of answer that there is if you can't, you know, you go through all your tests, they are unlikely to want to have a root canal done on the wrong tooth. And that's really, I mean, I wouldn't want one. So I think time is your, time is what you can use to better prepare yourself to get uh, a better answer to, you know, the, the, the tooth in question. Give it a week, call them, hey, what has changed? Is there any change in your symptoms? And if so, uh, can you better with one finger? That's what an oral surgeon in my residency was like. If you can one, you know, the, the question they always ask is one finger point to the pain. If it's kind of like, eh, I don't know where it is. Like, you know, you're going to expect like it might not be able to figure it out. But if after a week they can say, yeah, it's that tooth for 100 percent. then well, then it's time to do something. All right. So, um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, so you will find in um teeth that have pulp um pulp stones or sometimes cal- calcified pulp chambers the re- the cold response will be delayed um and as we talked about before just trying to determine what is a normal so testing teeth that are in the same quadrant testing the quadrilateral side um and then uh, maybe an opposing um also uh if you have teeth that have undergone trauma, you may often get a um, an unreliable cold test as well. So you won't be able to put as much weight on that cold test. Um, it may be delayed or not not there, um, but actually still could potentially be vital further down in the pulp uh, pulp anatomy. So. Those are the trickier cases, and those are ones that sometimes you have to just leave a little bit longer, or you pick up the phone and call and discuss and discuss different options. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, even just now, I got a message about a hot tooth on tooth number one seven. So that's really what this is about. It's kind of asking questions. What do I do? And what are some of the treatment options? Okay, so let's see from Mr. Smith. Dr. Smith, is there an interval for is there an interval for prescription prescribing antibiotics? Example, patient gets relief for two to three weeks, then root canal, then RTC with same symptoms. Then returns with Lucas, just uh unmute yourself, my friend. I can't understand that. All 
All right. Am I unmuted? You oh, there we go. Did. Yeah, no, just he returns to clinic or patient returns to clinic. I'm just wondering, because we don't routinely prescribe antibiotics for long periods of time. Yep. So patient gets relief from, say, irreversible pulpitis and then returns to clinic, say, in three weeks. How, how many times can we keep prescribing these, you know, amoxicillin and that type of thing? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I think if you can mute yourself again, or I'll do it for you, is um, the point is, is that let's try the pharmac. I think the point is, and in my, what my, my gut is telling me is that this is going, the, the COVID experience is going to change. I think what we need to do is you would reevaluate in the three weeks, you know, get them out of pain now, because that's all we can do is then, then in three weeks, we might be able to then selectively treat patients or your, uh, and then reevaluate that at that point and talk with your debt commander about that situation. Uh, that's really from my gut what I would, the advice I would give to you, because I can't, obviously, we can't put somebody on, um, you know, lifelong clindamycin for a dental tooth, for a tooth anyways. Reagan, any points? Yeah, and if the tooth is an, a symptomatic irreversible pulpitis and you did give them an antibiotic, and it, like you say, got them out of pain for two to three weeks, and then they're back. I guess your question is whether or not you would jump in and prescribe antibiotics again. Well, you could potentially uh, go to a different antibiotic, um, um, but we all know that antibiotics are not going to necessarily um, delay, or I guess it's not going to treat the outlying source of the pain, it's kind of delaying the inevitable. So again, at that point in time, you'd have to see what the patient's symptoms are, reevaluate the patient. If the patient is in that much discomfort, then I would be most likely engaging in starting the non-surgical retinal therapy. I've tried antibiotics once, again, this is just my, I don't have any um, literature to support what I'm saying at the moment. I guess I do a bit, but not, uh, 100%, but I don't think I would start another round. Now, if I had a patient and I gave them a course of antibiotics and I'm not seeing any improvement within the first couple of days, then I would jump in and add an adjunct such as metronidazole or um, or I would go to add clavonic acid with amoxicillin. So that's a little bit of a different situation. Does that answer your question? So, you know, uh, Major Holdren brought up a really good point because she's the now patient safety officer. Um, so if you have any patient safety incidents, you can email uh, Major Karen Holdren. And she said, can you talk about the risk of antibiotics, um, side effects, allergic reaction, and uh, any of those issues? So like we said, uh, there are, I mean, I didn't prepare to talk about that, but off my head, definitely there's always a possibility of having an allergic reaction and, and, you know, over the phone, that's one of the really critical things you need to ask them uh, in your screening. And maybe what I could do is actually, if anybody has a really good screening tool that you have at your debt that you have been using, because I don't have one, uh, if you could email it to me and then we can share that, you know, put together a couple and then collaborate together and get that sent out to everybody. So some of the questions you've been asking um, or even just a checklist that you've been using from your, for your teledentistry. So some of the side effects, obviously, um, link with whatever specific antibiotic. I don't have an answer for that one. And definitely always the risk of allergic reaction. And there's always a risk of increased resistance. We know about that. Um, but in these times, in, you know, we might need to mitigate the risk of, you know, creating that aerosol and, you know, as an indirect byproduct, infecting the receptionist who was just doing her own, that their own job and not even being part of the situation of the aerosol production when uh, pharmacological procedures could have mitigated that in the first place. Um, another question from Lucy, would you recommend over-the-counter oral gel to patients for pain management? And that's a really interesting question. And my experience has been that um, I'm shocked every time a patient has come to me and said, yeah, it has worked. So, you know, it's not a bad option. We're trying anything. Um, I wouldn't say as a professional, it's my professional opinion from, you know, Major Mark, like, oh, it's going to work. But, you know, 
why not give it a shot and let us know you know if you for especially for anything it's i've had patients come in with uh irreversible teeth uh necrotic and they said they put it on there now is it actually a placebo effect i don't know but if it present, you know, in my mind, if it prevents a patient from having to come in and get treatment at this stage in the next, say, two to three months, if it works, why not try it? Any any thoughts on that, Major Meadows? I uh, yeah, I've never used that really in my practice. I've, patients have told me they've tried it, um, but I don't think I would strongly recommend it. Um, I did some, find some information about systemic antibiotics um, with regards to um, uh, allergic reaction. So when you're looking for allergic reaction, you're looking for a rash, a, um, other skin reaction. You can have difficult breathing. Um, <coughs> excuse me. One of the other concerns that uh, we have with um, antibiotics is that they can cause quite a bit of stomach upset. So risk associated with uh, the use of antibiotics can cause nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, um, stomach cramps because we can upset the gut, the gut flora. So it's really important when you're talking with your patients that they're following whether or not they need to take their antibiotics with or without food. Um, then also risk of C. difficile. Um, some of the antibiotics that we prescribe for endodontic infections, clindamycin, amoxicillin, cephalosporins are all associated with C. difficile. So you have to make sure when you're talking with your patients, asking them if they have any underlying GI issues. I have a document from the AAE on the guidance of the use of systemic antibiotics, and it will all send that to major markets so we can send it to y'all because the um, 10-VK plus metronidazole used to be the standard uh, drug or combination that the AA used to use, but they've changed it. Um, so I'll send that to him and he can forward it to y'all. All right, cool. That's a great, uh, thank you so much for bringing it up. It's a great document as well. Now, uh, Captain Mary McDonald out in Moose Jaw, I think, has a great question. She says, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the PPE and for a high-risk procedure uh, requires full face shield with goggles. So are people not wearing loops? So that's a really good question. And let's find this out. It says face shield. Indeed. So let me just unpause my screen. So that's a really good point. So I just pulled up the CDO directive. So the personal protective equipment for PPE for high risk is the N95 respirator, eye goggles, and face shield, uh, surgical gown, and, and surgical gloves. So I'm going to assume that you can't wear loops. Now, I could be totally uh, wrong about that. Has anybody online been treating patients, and what has their experience been? Don't all talk at once. Actually, I think the boots with a high risk for aerosols are on page two, page three. Page three. Are you talking the boots? Is that what the question was? No, the question is, uh, so uh, ma'am, I really appreciate you sticking on here with uh, the discussion. So um, if I'm not mistaken, the PPE for high risk procedure requires full face shield with goggles. So are people not wearing loops? Yeah, I, I'll relay this question to the, I guess, the the team with Major Holdren and Major Fournier working on this. Wait. But at this point, obviously, with the dentistry taking a shift with airborne pathogens, um, obviously, we haven't caught up with how do we fix loops in that scenario. So at this point, honestly, the one kind of uh, prevents the other. So really, loops and goggles aren't compatible at this point in time in dentistry. So, so, uh, so the statement is we are using just literally uh, goggles. That's correct. So hopefully at this point, um, what mitigates it is we're not getting, obviously in, when you're doing your access cavity, it'd be nice to have better visibility, but um, hopefully most of the, I guess the micro spectrum of dentistry is 
kind of off the chart at this point, fixed bras or microsurgery. So that helps, but it does, it is an issue for those that really re require the loops for even like the access cavity and doing the pulpectomy. So at this point, I don't have a really good answer. Um, I'll relay it to the task force to see if they can figure out something. But I think what we're going through hasn't caught up with dentistry at this point. Um, hi, hi, ma'am. It's uh, Karen Holdren here. I could just chime in. Um, I just relayed the question um, to to the task team. Um, so we have discussed the use of, of loops extensively, um, and, and what the evidence shows right now, at least, is, is that. Um, sorry, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so um, when you're using or when you're generating an aerosol, um, an eye goggle will produce the best protection um, because it is um, closely fitted to the face and it's indirectly vented, um, whereas a loop doesn't provide that. So if you're wearing a loop, um, there are certain face shields that can accommodate a loop, but it doesn't protect your eyes from aerosols. It only protects your eyes from splashes. Um, so the recommendation at this time um, is to use an eye goggle, um, and that's to protect the mucous membranes of the eye from aerosols. Um, that's the best recommendation at this time, and I know that's that's not great for endo. Well, I could argue that we all have uh, microscopes in our clinics, so it might be a good time to practice up on using your scopes and throw away your goggles or throw away your loops. Well, that's definitely a good workaround with the scenario at this point. They Learning definitely can go over. Learning curve is super steep, and you no one will probably do it, but that's okay. Um, okay, so any last questions? Ma'am, do you have any last points? Um, before, obviously, I'll have to head out for another one o'clock timing, but um, I've been, like I said, partially in and out of this uh, training, but what I've heard was uh, great. Uh, I think it's awesome that you guys have put this training together on such short notice. Uh, you're covering very important points that link to COVID, you know, um, makeshift and improving, like you're adding that nuance to things. So it's not just sticking to the, the endo training. You're really doing that bridge, which is uh, great. So I'm happy to see all the folks that have joined in. The list is uh, very substantial. So that training is going to pay off. Uh, well done to both for doing this, taking questions. Uh, great platform as well. So uh, much appreciated on behalf of uh, the unit. Thanks. All right, ma'am, thank you so much. And uh, Reagan, any last points? I know, thank you all for uh, joining us and uh, we look forward to uh, meeting with you next week. Yeah, so next week we're gonna keep it to about an hour, maybe an hour and a half with some discussions. But the real idea is we're gonna talk about um, anesthesia and then some other topic, like radiographs. So. Stay tuned for that. I really appreciate your time. This is going to be recorded. So if there's some important points you want to review, um, great. If you have any questions about the stuff you saw or you have any other questions you want to talk about, just email me. We may not talk about it as a group, but I can totally send you, uh, we can do a video discussion just personally about some of your questions and then they may lead into future discussions. So that being said, thank you so much for your time. I'm grateful and uh, you know, stay connected with the family and I appreciate your service. Take care.